afternoon, we have a distinguished guest with us, Mr. Chris Hawk. He has been in the insurance industry for probably 25 years. He is a consummate um, producer on his own. He works with companies such as Midland, um, National Life Group, LSW, Allianz, you name it. He'll tell you more about it. Uh, he's a top producer um, and a benefits coordinator that travels all over the country uh, helping companies to sign up their employees. Chris, can we hear from you for a second? Absolutely, and thank you for pumping me up. I feel special now. You are special. <laughs> I love your, uh, by the way, I love your screenshot. I'm, I'm going to steal it. I'm Tell Miss uh, Christine here, I'm going to have to steal her her screenshot. You're just giving me an idea. I, I want to emulate you. This is really professional. I love your podcast here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying. Anyway, let's get right into this because you have so much to tell us today. Um, I wanted to interview Chris because he had a personal experience, but I want to first get into how this pandemic has affected your life personally and also your business. So what has been, um, what has this pandemic personally and professionally done in your realm? Well, personally, of course, uh, personally speaking, I always say like most people, it affects your normal, I guess, day-to-day -day routine um, from being able to socialize. That gets to be a thing. Um, of course, it's not easy to go home and see your family members because of the situation. I have one family member that don't even let, don't even trust our own family to come visit. They say they took social distancing on steroids, but uh, it's just one aspect in life. When you live long enough, like your grandparents used to tell you, you'll see things over time and it'll wake you up to some realities that you never thought about previously. In addition to that, are you, um, has it made you more aware of some personal aspects that you think all people should be aware of that are that have not insured themselves or their family. Hands down, you just uh, hands down, you just said that in a very professional, honest reality. Uh, the one thing from an insurance agent as well as real estate, almost everybody spent all of 2021 pivoting to the virtual meetings, you know, virtual interviews, virtual everything. Um, a lot of employers have now woke up to the reality that they don't need to have as many uh, players in brick and mortar locations anymore. So everybody has learned from this situation. And thank God, because prior to technology, you know, coming into the 90s, if this would have happened in the 90s or 80s, we'd really be up the creek as far as business wise. Um, other than that, uh, I think that this situation has really woken a lot of people up about diseases, what they call, um, I don't want to say chronic, but I want to say, um, oh my God, I'm sorry, it escapes me, but things that are um, holistically are uh, onset through, you know, the, the chaining of the body's chemistry as opposed to physical injuries, uh, diseases, cancers, strokes, things, these are things that people really just don't take serious until something close to them happens, so this has been a very good wake up call. Insurance sales have been very strong over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, a lot of uh, producers, of course, are uh, hitting new record highs because people are waking up to the reality that this stuff is real. But with that, um, I will say as a 30 year agent in this business, I'm gonna simply state that this is what people needed to understand. Today's new hybrid life insurance plans help cover certain situations like this more than ever than before. Uh, before this, uh, Ms. Butler, if you were to talk to an uh, average insurance agent, we, I guess they used to call that word uh, silo, where you silo all the categories from one another, where you segregate them. You had life insurance for death, separate category. Disability for disability insurance, you know, income payments, you had to be out of work a certain amount of time before your monthly income checks would kick in. And then, of course, long-term care, uh, which most people don't relate to until they're 60. But then by then, it's usually too late because for the average middle-class person, 
probably earning from thirty to sixty thousand dollars a year, they're sticker shocked by the price of long term care after you turn sixty. So, with that being said, um, the good news is for your listeners that are listening to Rosalind Butler here, they're going to learn that today's new hybrid life insurance plan pretty much covers everything. Uh, I like to call it the best gap coverage if you can't afford all the single coverages. So that's what the uh, living benefits life insurance now does for people. You don't have to die for someone else to benefit. You now can use it for yourself as well. Well, you know, I cre I created a special um, program called Creating Wealth in the Minority Community. And there has been a conversation swirling about minority men and their reluctance to buy insurance. And it's for a myriad of reasons, but one of the big ones is they don't feel that they want to leave money behind for their wife or spouse or whoever to find them a new mate or person. And we want to try to break this down and dispel it because if we think about it, this wealth gap that is moving through the country and people are seeing that for good health and age, you can be worth 300000 500000 a million dollars because you have good health and, and age is on your side. And even if you buy the policy early. So I kind of want you to incorporate a concept so that the men listening to this are going to get it and how these policies, particularly the IUL or the hybrid, as you call it, policy, helps you to keep wealth in your pocket rather than it going out the door and create a legacy for your family. That's where we're going with this particular podcast. I want men to understand that they're missing a golden opportunity to protect their family for a lifetime and to protect themselves. Because once you get into your story about how your health went bad and how this policy came to the to the, save the day, let's go there. Definitely, definitely. By the way, I, I appreciate that we are doing this on the internet, uh, your podcast. Uh, are they going to be seeing me live here um, speaking as I answer your question because I, I see you, you know, of course I see you on my screen, but I'm yeah. wondering when, as, as it, yes, it could be, if I put on YouTube. Okay, I'm going to take one hot second here, just one, I'm going to take a hot second, click off, and I'm going to come right back. You stay right there, okay? One second. Okay. Okay. So everybody's still there, right, Ms. Bronze? I'm here. Perfect. Um, I just, I always like to do a little show and tell, like they used to do in school, you know, <laughs> so I can show this and you and feel free to circulate it uh, uh, with your viewers if they want to. There's nothing to hide here. Uh, as a young man growing up, I remember vividly as a kid, the jokes that the older guys would always tell. And to me, an older person might be 45, 50, but they'd make jokes about, uh, if they die tomorrow, let the next man take care of my wife because, you know, she's going to go out there and get remarried. We've heard these little sarcastic sayings over the decades. Uh, ethnically speaking, I heard some of the same things said about the Spanish people uh, being the Mexicans, Puerto Ricans. And in reality, I found out of the 30 years that I've been doing this business, especially going state to state, you know, I've been licensed in 40 states. I have met face-to-face -face with people, especially during their open enrollment seasons, when they're doing their employee benefits, you know, during open enrollment. And I've heard it quite a few times across the board. And while statistically certain minorities, be it Black, Spanish, may have higher numbers of not wanting to address this situation, it's still a gray spot in everyone's planning. I know that there's a lot of agents that are doing very well working with attorneys because uh, when a court degree is handed down through a divorce or for child support, the smarter attorneys will mandate that they want insurance on you know, the person who has the obligation to pay to support the uh, you know, alimony, et cetera. And I'm just here to tell you that the safest and most honest and professional way to be said, I'll tell a person, even if they're selfish and they don't care about nobody other than themselves, 
to get as much as you can of this on yourself is going to be mission critical because as we get older every 10 years, it doesn't kick in until you turn 50, but by 60, that's when it starts setting in. You start to realize your independence is always at risk if you don't have wealth and money. And in America, I take the Christian saying, food, clothing, and shelter. Food, clothing, and shelter. Three things that every human being should and hopefully can produce for themselves. And until you own your home, and until you have guaranteed income, such as a pension if you stop working, or lifetime disability payments, you got to ask yourself, how will you maintain your food, clothing, and shelter if you cannot do that due to your loss of health? In some cases, for proud people, you might feel like you're better off dead than to have to suffer watching everything in your life come to pieces. You know, uh, your car gets repossessed, you get evicted out of your apartment, your house foreclosed, creditors come after you because you just simply can't meet your bills. Um, if you had told me back in 2011, when I bought this policy uh, at the time, National Life and Life of the Southwest, that's who I got my policy with, um, I love the concept because we could see it coming in the late 90s, but it, by 2008, uh, by 2010, it had come alive and a lot more insurance companies were now starting to offer these hybrid living benefit life insurance plans so that people can protect themselves personally. And if they want to make sure that their estate or their legacy, if they care, then they can protect their family and also in some cases leave even more to their communities if they participate in things such as church, alumni, and everything. So just to answer your question, Rod, just I tell people, even if for a selfish person who's all about themselves, you're going to want to own one of these things and you want to get it as soon as possible and you want to get as much as possible because the beauty is you have over 30 good companies out there that offer these plans, but there's only three to four of them that have the best plans out there available today. And I know because I bought it. And at the end of the day, if you don't want to do it for anybody else, just do it so you don't become a burden to your family. Did I hit that okay for you, Ross? That's fantastic. Yeah, and you, I mean, you hit keep asking. But... <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. Let's get a little bit into your story about how your illness occurred. Well, let's start with the living benefits side of it. What are the three most <coughs> important benefits that you see with the living benefit program? Well, first of all, um, you know, it used to be called critical illness insurance, which is still very much out there. This was a product that was payroll deducted by a lot of companies. You've heard of companies such as Aflac, and they would have these things called the cancer policy. Uh, then they'd have another one called um, heart attack policy, you know, and these are what we used to call supplemental benefits. And those policies are very, very much worth it. They, they usually price between 25 to $40 a month, depending on if you're by yourself or you have a family. Uh, they're designed to cover possible out-of-pocket medical expenses that may not be covered by your regular health insurance. And people, again, like most general consumers, until you really sit down and think about it, you never make the connection, even though you go to work for years, you've been buying health insurance for years, and until something really happens that makes you focus on a set of circumstances, as a general consumer, even business owners, they just don't get it. Uh, so what we try to explain to people, the top three categories, hands down, for what, what used to be sold separately is just critical illness, is again, it's going to be your cancer, your heart attacks, your strokes. Those are the three that most people will relate to. However, there are over 20 different major, what they call chronic and critical illnesses that these new living benefit life insurance policies will cover. And the beauty of it, depending on which company, I want everybody that's listening to this podcast to know that all companies are different. You know, we have over uh, 1,600 uh, registered insurance companies in the United States, you know, by AM Best, Standard & Poor's, the top insurance companies. And then when it comes to living benefits as a hybrid add-on to a life insurance policy, some people think of it as a rider, but it's part of the hybrid plans. You only have about a good 20 companies that offer them. Uh, I asked myself why other companies haven't 
got on board with it yet. They are slowly, surely coming on board with it. But at the end of the day, they just simply don't want to be in that business. So they don't offer it. But the beauty of this is, uh, again, we're talking about the ability to liquidate or to cash out a portion of your death benefit without injuring your policy. And my story is simple. Um, around, I'm going to I wanted to tie something in for people that might be listening that have a regular um, health insurance and how these policies can additionally help. Let's say you have an Obama plan and you have a critical illness or you don't and you need a surgery. Yes. Critical illness policy can also serve to pay that gap. Let's say you selected the silver plan and it doesn't pay as much as the gold or some of the, the platinum. Therefore, you can activate through Aflac or Colonial or one of these companies, a standalone critical illness policy to cover that bridge. And I've seen a lot of people sell it that way. Yes. So you'll have your Obamacare insurance plan. If you have a stroke or a heart attack, then if you bought the Aflac policy, you can use that to cover that 5000 or $7,000 bridge uh, for you. So there is a need or a way to cover bridging some of these gaps in these policies. And Absolutely. I thought that was a segue into that. Definitely. And what people don't understand, those are known as healthcare supplements, those standalone policies. And the reason why they're called healthcare supplements, uh, almost pretty much in all uh, 50 states, if, the, if it's a filed as a healthcare product, that means when you make a claim, you can safely believe and, and know that you won't have any income taxes because these supplements are designed to give you, the policyholder, cash. That's tax-free money you're going to get as long as it's for a qualified medical event. And from health insurance standpoint of view, the two I got you, well, there's technically three. The first one is always going to be the deductible. We grew up thinking that a $1,000 deductible was a lot, but as the 90s rolled around, it quickly became 2000 then towards the end of 2000, it became 2000, 5000, and some people have deductibles as high as 10 to $20,000 just so they can keep those insurance premiums down. I believe that's our government fault, but that's a discussion for another day. But the bottom line is I tell people, if you have a major situation where you have to be hospitalized, your first out of pocket expense is always gonna be the deductible, 1000, 10,000, whatever. That's what you're supposed to pay before the insurance company starts to pay anything. That's what makes your prices go up and down on your health care costs. The bigger the deductible, uh, that means you're telling the insurance company that you're prepared for an emergency or rainy day. Therefore, the bigger the deductible, the cheaper the premiums. The lower the deductible, the more expensive the premiums because the insurance company knows that if you make a claim, they're going to have to pay pretty, you know, pretty soon right away. So that's number one. Then you have what is called shared medical expenses, better known as the 80-20, 75-25. That's where after you meet your deductible, you know, uh, you're going to share as the doctors or hospital continue to bill the insurance company, you'll either go 80-20, meaning they'll pick up 80% of the bills and you'll pick up the balance of 20% of the bills until you hit what is called your stop loss. And to make a long story short, let's just say that you've already hit your deductible. You went to see the doctor again and he billed the insurance company $1,000, but you had an 80-20 plan. That means the insurance company would pay 800 of that thousand and you would still be required to pay the last, you know, um, 2,000, the 20% to, to have your, you know, your shared cost. Then when you get to your stop, loss, the max out of pocket, the insurance company, the health insurance policy will pay 100% for the rest of that calendar year or the rest of that fiscal year. Because keep in mind, if you have a prolonged illness or injury and it goes into the next calendar year or the next fiscal year, then that deductible is going to come around again and you're going to have to meet that deductible again. So that's another reason why healthcare supplements as well as living benefits, life insurance are two very Excellent points. And uh, what I try to tell people, 
Um, uh, various companies have various uh, living benefit clauses. Um, I like the companies that have this thing called indemnity. An indemnity policy means that when you file a claim, they send you a check, that's it. Uh, the other is called reimbursement. Uh, reimbursement means they want you to pay the bills first and then you send in the receipts and then they reimburse you up to whatever they determine is the maximum allowable or the exact bill. But the stronger living benefit plans as well as the healthcare supplement plans, they all are indemnity. I always look for indemnity companies. I think we pay enough in premiums to these insurance companies. They make millions off of us. The last thing I need them to do is to be cheap with the benefits. So that's just my opinion professionally, but the indemnity policies do not require you to be out of work for any length of time. They don't require you to lose a certain percentage of your salary. They don't require waiting periods. Uh, that's where traditional disability, you might have to be out of work, you know, one week, two weeks, 30 days, 90 days before the disability policy will pay your replacement of your lost income. And it's also usually up to 60% of your take home pay. That's what the disability game is all about with disability insurance. So again, we come back to the two strongest products that people should have, regardless of your age, with you know, whichever um, situation you're in, you want at least one good healthcare policy. I've been with Aflac now for almost 26 years. You got Colonial, Aflac, Allstate, Unum, just to name a few that offer these, you know, supplemental plans, physician life insurance. I've pretty much sold and, you know, uh, marketed all of them during uh, employee payroll deduction, you know, uh, services that we provide during open enrollment season. But I tell everybody you want at least one good healthcare supplement to protect your wallet. And then you want a good life insurance policy with living benefits because at the end of the day, you're going to be surprised that to be able to make a claim and know that that lump sum of money is coming or that it's going to be coming every month, you can set it up any way you like. You know that your lifestyle will be protected for those who care. And of course, for your family members, you'll be protecting them as well. Thank you. The next living benefit that we want to discuss is the um, chronic condition. Okay. Same thing earlier now, because uh, I know, I'm, by the way, I'm sorry, I've been putting this off because I got a little bit more into detail. But again, you have critical illness, which is usually your heart attacks, your stroke, and your cancer. Now, here's the difference. Chronic and critical can be slightly confusing, but here's the difference. Critical usually is a sudden onslaught. You just suddenly have a heart attack, you know, aneurysms. You hear all these things that strike people all of a sudden, and they're instantly, they're incapacitated. That's why they call it critical, because usually it strikes the body so hard and fierce, and you're pretty much going to be out of work. Uh, I had a friend of mine up in Washington whose younger brother is only just turned 50 last year. Triple bypass. Unbelievable. Nice, slim, young-looking man, but I guess his diet is bad. How do you know? But he, and he's not out of shape at all. He's slim. But it was amazing to see that this gentleman who just turned 50 or 51 had triple bypass. He could have been dead, but he, you know, he lived, he survived, he's doing fine today, but he's been out of work for almost nine months while he's recovering. Now, chronic illness, as opposed to critical, critical is usually a sudden event, but chronic means something that you're probably going to live with for the rest of your life. Uh, some of those things are like arthritis, uh, hypertension, better known in some cases as high blood pressure, diabetes, things that you can only try to control and hope to get better over time, but you'll probably live with them for the rest of your life until the day you die. Also chronic illness, dementia, or sometimes Alzheimer's, things like that. In other words, it comes on slow, but as we get older, sometimes it picks up and it gets a little more serious and a little more challenging over the years, if not over the decades. So chronic is usually something like that, uh, which could result in some people needing uh, nursing home care or in-home nursing care. And so what chronic means is that you start to need maybe a little bit of assistance because of your condition. And if it gets progressively worse, you might need to have nurses come to your home part of the day or 24 hour a day nursing in your home, or you might need to go into assisted living better known as nursing home. But either way, we know that's gonna be a bill. It's gonna be quite large. And by today's standards, you're lucky if you can find one with a floor of 3,000, but they're all averaging anywhere now from four to 10,000 a month for a reputable facility that you know you're gonna get good quality care. 
So that's where the chronic illness part of the living benefits comes in handy because again, you can strategically liquidate the death benefit on your insurance policy to help cover those out-of-pocket expenses. And keep in mind, when you make a claim uh, of your living benefits off of your you know, uh, hybrid life insurance policy, you control how much you can take out of the policy. Uh, again, if it's a qualified medical expense, you know that means the money you're gonna get is tax-free as long as it meets the IRS guidelines for per diem and long-term care and qualified you know, medical expenses, you won't have to worry about a tax bill. And in many cases, as this pandemic year has shown us, we've had a lot of people that had million dollar claims, even though they're not dying, but they, you know, they suffered a critical illness or something that uh, forced them to have a claim. And I can tell you in certain communities like our Asian communities and some of the um, Jewish communities, these people were filing claims uh, you know, for as much as $1 million to $2 million tax-free because they got diagnosed, they got treated, they survived it, but it was a qualifying event. So now these people have their homes are paid off. Uh, maybe they accelerated their retirement planning. You know, you fund up a non-qualified retirement plan, uh, but it's just so many ways you can pitch this with respect to everyday life realities that will be met if you happen to have one of these plans. That's very um, great information because people don't understand that once they slip into this nursing home uh, program or they slip into any of this assisted living, if you don't have these kind of pr products available to you uh, yes. and you own a home, you could be putting that home in jeopardy. Therefore, your heirs may not get that property. It may Most be- definitely. It will be different. taken over by the state to um, for your care, and you definitely don't want to have that happen. And um, like, you just hit on something that's very critical that even a lot of CPAs don't understand. And unless they're an estate planning attorney or an elder law attorney, those are the two attorneys you would talk to about protecting your assets. I don't care how young you are, how old you are. If you're making good money and you're in a good place in life, with yourself, you want to look into these plans early before they're needed. With the state, it's simple. Um, you don't hear about it until people get on Social Security, but it can happen at any age. It's called spin down. And what that is, if you are a person that needs to go into a nursing home, but you don't quite have all the money you need to get the home you want to go to, then that means you go to a state run or government run facility. But in order to qualify for that, you have to, for all intents and purposes, you need to be legally broke or bankrupt. That means if they find out you got any assets or equity in the house, they want you to tap that first, spin that up and hock yourself up and basically, you know, foreclose on yourself, you know, or your family. Uh, it's called spin down. And then if you die and they want to double check, you'll get a bill usually from the Social Security Administration where they're trying to recover some of the costs of your care if you didn't have enough social security. And a lot of people these days are working without benefits. So we know 10, 20 years, a lot of people haven't been contributing to social security. You know, the FICA taxes as we call it. So uh, the state will look to uh, uh, put a lien on any assets that were in your name during the time you were going through treatments or, you know, nursing home care and then at your death if you don't already have it, you know, put away in a living trust or what have you, then the states will put a levy or a lien on it to try to recover their costs. And of course, that's how they force people to sell and your family could be on the street. So again, living benefits plans, it's another way to hopefully buy a good three to five years minimum. If you price it out right, you're looking to give yourself three to five years of replacement income to, you know, to protect yourself and your family. And then if you're really smart and you work with a good attorney, then a good estate planning attorney, until you become legally broke or have all your assets alienated from your name, then you just have to look at those possibilities for strategic planning that's based on due diligence to protect your family and those you care about. Great point. Another aspect of this, um, what would you call it? Um, Living benefits, life insurance. No, standalone. Oh, standalone. Okay. The standalone. What you call it? 
Oh, the health care supplements. You're talking the, about the, the health No, the Unum sales. Right. It's a standalone uh, long-term care. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Standalone loan from care policy. Go ahead. When you purchase those, there is a little caveat there. As you get older, those rates do go up. <laughs> this is another reason why you need to purchase a life insurance policy with the critical, the chronic, and the terminal in it because you don't have those fees going up. Absolutely. I can't even realize that when I started looking at them and I said, Oh, they have a feature here where there are fees that every year as your age increases, uh, the fees. Mo most people have never really thought about these policies and other things where insurance has fees. And therefore, as age comes upon you, unless you're in a real life insurance policy that gives you these benefits automatically, and that's probably why, Chris, you were saying the companies don't want to get in this business. Uh, they're eating those fees or they're making money off of these fees that they're charging people. But now that the public has become aware that they can get it inside a life insurance policy, why would you want to pay the fees? Go ahead and get it for free in the program and then you don't have to worry about that. Yes. The other thing I wanted to mention to people is as a person who has aging parents, and let's say you're in your 40s, your parent has been ill for a few years, you would do yourself a favor to pay for a long-term care policy for them and don't wait. And if you know that it's gonna be something that as time goes forward, that's gonna be debilitating, you're the one that's gonna end up paying for this. A policy would do you well that you were paying for on your parent so that you don't get hit with these $4,000, $7,000 a month bills. I know several people whose parents have dementia and this Alzheimer's, and they had to put them in a facility, they're paying 7000 a month. That's not very comfortable. And you have your own family to take care of. You got your own insurance to take care of. A little bit of planning before this, as a young person with an aging parent, you might want to consider this. Where are you at on that, Chris? Uh, definitely. And I got to tell you, uh, I even kicked myself because of some of my agent. Uh, I only have a handful of my relatives left at this point in my life. But I remember in the 90s when people started passing away through the natural process of, you know, just their time comes, so they transition and they die. Uh, I remember the problem too uh, with certain family members when you, t you know, how do you tell a family, look, I like to take life insurance out on you. And especially with all these crazy TV shows, you know, 48 hours and, you know, all the crazy shows where people's own right. kids are knocking them off and everything. The Menendez <laughs> brothers, take your choice. Who wants it? And why are you taking insurance out on me at this point? You know, <laughs> but people joke about that, but they really don't understand that the impact just, you know, even when, uh, before my uh, aunt passed in 2003, the last three years, the last 48, uh, the last two years of those three years, when it really came home that she did not want to live anymore because she was older. But then you, you see the slide, the dementia, the Alzheimer's and the 24 hour care, it's, it's lethal. It's butt kicking because now you can't help these people who took care of you your whole life. And unfortunately, I guess for some of us, we just never had that difficult conversation that regardless of who you are in the family, especially for all adults, there should be life insurance on every one of your members. Uh, I think, um, especially with the black community in America and a lot of the other communities that you see frustrated over social injustice, they don't understand that if you don't hold title to the major assets in your community, which would be your homes, your businesses, you know, to have complete financial control of your life, then you're subject to politics and business you know, where they move people in and out of, you know, certain communities. And then for your relatives who you claim to love, your parents, your grandparents, your aunt and uncle, if they don't get it, they don't understand that they won't be enjoying their home much longer if they ever become, you know, critically or chronically ill. They're going to have to be moved. And then the worst thing about that, uh, California, New York, Connecticut, even Nevada, Arizona, uh, the more preferred homes, which used to be just average, but now they've got so much guaranteed business, especially with the pandemic, people don't realize they can charge up to the moon to get the best cash playing customers when these situations strike. 
So I tell people uh, at least having a good, you know, hopefully uh, 500 or a million dollars of this, you can take your time and shop and work with, you know, your relatives. If God forbid something's coming on or it suddenly strikes because this is going to be your reserve, your ace in the hole, as they say. So um, uh, I, I, I can relate to anybody who says my family don't want to hear this. They want to talk. I get it. But if someone becomes ill, who gets power of attorney? You know, remember, one thing is to have power of attorney for health care with the hospitals. Who gets to make the you know, decision with your doctors? Who gets to pull the plugs or whatever? Do not resuscitate. That's one aspect of what they call your health care directive or your medical power of attorney. Then, of course, if the person does need medical uh, nursing home care, will you be able to provide it at home where it's going to be cheapest? Will you just have to have the nurse or the caretakers, you know, come stay there X amount of hours per day? Or if God forbid, uh, worse yet, they have this situation strike and they still have a mortgage. How do you protect that mortgage? So this is the most difficult thing you'll ever discuss. Life insurance, long-term care, uh, estate planning, such as your wills, living trust. These are all things that go into your independence, whoever you are, regardless of your situation. If you like your lifestyle, you like having a choice, you got to think about these products. You got to put them somewhere in your plans and you want to get them in there fast. So if I might interject, a friend of mine, a mentor that I had early on, he suggested that you get a policy on your parent who maybe not, who doesn't have a lot to leave you as an inheritance and look at it as an inheritance. That You're is paying a for a policy so that you will have an inheritance once they succumb in addition to all these benefits, a wonderful way of looking at purchasing for a parent or an aunt or whomever. Yeah, well, two ways to look at it. I've known plenty of people that said they'll do it if their kids pay for it, because again, they just don't get the legacy aspect, but they just simply don't care. It's a matter of preference. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned in my 60 years now on earth, you just have to accept people for who they are and make their plans accordingly. But uh, a lot of people don't like the fact, I don't know where a lot of us get this attitude, well, I'm making you rich, not necessarily. The number one thing that I think that we lose in our history, no matter who you are, what generation, what nationality, people don't understand your legacy doesn't exist until you do something about it. And that's why a lot of people don't understand. They're talking about, you know, moving in certain communities and certain states and how the demographics change. I said, of course they change because the people who should have owned, you know, the assets in those zip codes, they didn't do things to protect it. They didn't leave nothing behind when they left. And therefore, you know, the next generation will not relate to it. So uh, life insurance does create an immediate estate without a doubt, because it's a big death benefit. And under U.S. laws, it's state and federally tax free. And it might be subject to a state tax unless, you know, if it goes over a certain amount, uh, like over a million or whatever, then you might want to put a cheap what they call ILET, Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust, so it stays 100%, you know, uh, tax-free. But the bottom line is, uh, you do create an estate when you take out life insurance. But as we said at the beginning today, you don't have to die for someone else to get it. This is a benefit you can always use while you're alive as well. So I think people need to understand being able to liquidate. I'm going to give you a hypothetical. Let's just say I had a $500,000 life insurance policy. I get diagnosed with cancer. I only need 100,000 of that for now to maintain my lifestyle over the next two or three years. Well, then I reduce the death benefit from 500,000 down to 400,000 and I take out 100,000, you know, to use for myself, my living expenses, et cetera. For parents, if you've got kids going through college and they depend on you to put them through college, uh, parents who might have kids in junior high or high school that's going to a private school and you got tuition, these are things that can stop when you become chronic or critically ill. So living benefits is designed to protect your budget, your, you know, your, your earnings, your assets, and your obligations. That's where it's gonna shine the most. Let's um, take a little quick break right here. I wanted just to mention that if anyone has any questions for uh, Mr. Hawk, 
or myself, leave your name in the chat. We will get back with you.